What is a cannonball's maximum range? What is the velocity of an object at any instant? How small is infinitesimal? These were some of the top questions being asked during Newton's lifetime. It wasn't until he created calculus that he was able to answer them. This video is a little math heavy, but the next two in this series will focus on sensors and troubleshooting. Using a 10 foot version of the 60 foot ramp showed in the last video, we can determine the average velocity of the ball. The average velocity is the slope of the secant line. This is the change in position over the change in time. If we start out with two brake beams, we can get the average velocity over the entire ramp. We can add another sensor and obtain the average velocity over two sections of the ramp. This gives us a slightly better insight into how the ball is moving. We can keep adding sensors in between the existing ones until we run out. We know the velocity at smaller and smaller sections along the ramp. This gives us a better understanding of the motion of the ball. But we still don't know the velocity at every instance. This is one of Zeno's paradoxes. If you tried to exit a room by having your distance to the door, you'd spend your whole life getting closer and closer, but never leaving. We can look at this graphically. Let's say we want to know the velocity at exactly this point, and not the average velocity between the two points. We would need to know the slope of the tangent line that intersects the curve at the point we're interested in. The slope of this line is the instantaneous velocity at that point. To find the slope of any line, we need to have two data points, but we only know the value for one. As we added sensors, our secant line connecting the two data points got smaller and smaller. We can create secant lines that get shorter and shorter as we close in on our point of interest. As we do this, the slope of our secant line gets closer to the slope of the tangent line. We can draw smaller and smaller secant lines and approach any value on our graph, but we will never reach them. The closest we can get is an infinitesimally small secant line. Fermat determined that we could write this out mathematically. Our instantaneous velocity is equal to the displacement we move in an infinitesimally small amount of time. E is the small change in time. This equation is saying that we are moving the tiniest physical amount possible over a time that is not zero, but really, really close to zero. This was the best we could do. We're trying to converge on a point. An alternative way of stating this would be to say that we're looking at the limit of the change in position over the change in time as time two approaches closer and closer to time one, shrinking the gap. A quick aside in case you don't know what the f's in the parentheses are. They're functions. A function is a kind of equation, but it has a special property. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the change of f of x and x. y is equal to t squared as a function because for every value of t, there's only one value for y. y is equal to the square root of t is not a function. There are two solutions for y for every value of t. Let's use the function f of t is equal to 9t squared, where t is the time and f of t is the function that tells us how distance changes over time. If we want to find the instantaneous velocity somewhere on this function, we can use our fancy new limit equation. We know f of t is equal to 9 times t squared. To get the function of t plus the incremental e, we need to plug in t plus e for the original t. f of t plus e is equal to 9 times the quantity t plus e squared. We can plug these values into our limit equation. We want to get rid of some of the terms and make this equation into something we can use and understand more intuitively. We can expand the first term by using FOIL. First, outers, inners, and last. Multiply out the 9 and we can cancel out some terms. The 9t squared goes away and we can divide by the incremental e. This leaves us with 18t plus 9e. And since e is approaching zero, anything that is multiplied by zero is, well, zero. This means we can eliminate the 9e term. This leaves us with 18t. This new function is our velocity at the point we're trying to converge on. This function is called the derivative of the original function and is often marked with an apostrophe. This is known as a prime. f of t is 9t squared, and this tells us how the distance is changing over time. F prime of t is 18t, and this tells us how the velocity changes with respect to time. Let's be honest, that wasn't very fun. We would have to do this for every function that we come across, and some functions are much more complex than that. So Newton created a proof that allows us to quickly determine the derivative. In our example, we did t plus e raised to the second power. Newton looked at what happened when you raised a binomial like t plus e to the nth power. n could be any number from zero to infinity. He did a lot of foiling. And he used Pascal's triangle. 
for a shortcut for the coefficients of expansion. For each of them, he expanded out the terms, plugged them into the limit function, canceled out terms, and then he ended up with n times t to the n minus 1. If we look back at our function, this actually works. The 2 comes out in front, and then the power is 2 minus 1. This is called the power rule. It allows us to take equations like this and find the derivative within seconds. There are whole tables you can use to determine how to take derivatives of more complex functions. We should be able to get by with just knowing the power rule for a while. We have found the velocity at any instant and solved the infinitesimal problem. Now we can move on to the cannonball issue. Tangents help us know the maximum and minimum points for our curves. If we go back to the ramp and roll the ball up the incline, you will see the ball travels upwards, pauses, and then goes back down the ramp. We place sensors every inch along the ramp. Applying the change of position of the ball over time forms a parabola. We can create a line of best fit and find the equation for this line. This equation is the function of the motion of the ball. Using the power rule, we can take the derivative of the function of motion. The derivative is the instantaneous velocity of the ball. As we learned, instantaneous velocity is also equal to the slope of the tangent line drawn on the function of motion. Changes in tangent lines give us general information about the velocity of the ball. When we draw tangent lines in the pink side of the graph, the slope is positive. The slope of the tangent lines in the green section is zero, and the slope of the tangent lines in the yellow section is negative. A slope of zero means we have hit a local maximum or minimum. This is an inflection point. The velocity in the pink section was pointed in the positive direction. The velocity decreased in magnitude as it rolled up the ramp until it got to the green section. At the green section, the velocity of the ball was zero, and the ball had reached its maximum height. The ball then changed its direction, which was indicated by the slope becoming negative. The magnitude of the velocity increased as it rolled back down. The magnitude of the ball's velocity at the start and at the end were close to 3.4 feet per second. The velocity was in the positive direction on the way up and in the negative direction on the way down. The ball took equal time to roll up the ramp as it did to roll down the ramp. If we do not have sensors but we have the equation for velocity, we can find the time elapsed. We know the velocity is zero at the peak. Now we can solve for the time it took to roll up the ramp. If we double this time, we will know the time for the total trip. Applying this principle, we can find the range of the cannonball. The range is equal to the initial velocity in the x direction multiplied by the time elapsed during flight. We'll dive into this in more depth later in the series when we start to build and launch some paper rockets. So far, we have learned that the average velocity of an object is the slope of the secant line. The instantaneous velocity is the slope of the tangent line and can be found by taking the limit function of the motion. The simpler method for finding instantaneous velocity is to take the derivative of the function of motion using the power rule. When the derivative is zero, there's a peak on our curve and something interesting might be happening. For instance, our rover might be trying to climb a steep hill and has lost its traction. We might need to shift its direction to a new spot on the hill. This video was made with the support of the Vlogbrothers. Thank you for exploring with us, and we will see you next time.